After the Bible school last week, I, I was a zombie. Uh, that's nothing new. Um, I mean, I, I was just plain not thinking anything. And, um, but I knew I had to get ready for this Sunday. And so I, I said, I don't know what I'm going to speak about. Um, I'm just blank. So Cheryl looked at me in surprise and said, reward and punishment number four. <laughs> and, um, and so the, the Holy Spirit says she's right. <laughs> and so here we go. Reward and punishment number four. So I sincerely hope that you have been reading and rereading um, Matthew, uh, Luke chapter 15 because um, it's pretty obvious that there's more there than most people think. And so I'm again going to assume you pretty much know these stories, but um, just a couple of verses to sort of get us on this track. Um, he comes back to the father. This is the, the first guy, um, the younger brother, and the verse 19 says, I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me as one of your hired men. Hold that. And then in verse 29, the elder brother um, in rage says to the father, look, for so many years I've been serving you, never neglected a command, yet you've never given me a kid, a baby goat, that I might be merry with my friends. Those two statements were the rewards that these two men expected. And I want to look at reward and punishment. Um, I've, I've spent three weeks dismissing it and saying that we live in the grace of God and do not live by reward or punishment. But then, as some have reminded me, there's a lot of stuff in the New Testament that talks about reward and talks about crowns that are given out and everything. Um, and that's what I want to look at. But in so doing, I know I'm going to upset a lot of people. Uh, what's new? But um, th this could really upset people because the church today, and, and many times it, it overlaps with what we call religion, they've cultivated a view of end times. And it was almost a relief if you study, because that wasn't so until in the 1800s. For nearly 2,000 years, the church never had that view of end times that is held today. Um, and, and they will fight to death for it today, but it's only um, a few years old, and I won't even go into that. But they, they cultivated this view of the end times almost as a relief of somewhere to put everything that they didn't understand. And so because they had thrown out the Holy Spirit, and therefore much of the gospel didn't make sense, they found the end times, we found the place to put it. And everything became after you die. And if, you, if you're going to make it beyond that, it will be when Jesus comes. And then everything happens. Everything happens. But as for now, psh, go to church, hang out, and hope he comes quickly uh, because nothing else is happening. And, and, um, and really, that's, that's the truth. I, as usual, I went to uh, read what some of our religious leaders are saying today, so you, I'm not making this up. A and under rewards and uh, all of this, it was, it, was some, it was reading Santa Claus at Macy's because it was, and I quote, that, that when Jesus comes, <clears throat> heaven will place where he's handing out rewards in abundance. So everybody, and they're handing out. I can see Santa Claus handing everything out. And that was the impression given that when, when, and of course the other thing was when we get to heaven, 
which of course is an unbiblical expression anyway, um, but it will be a place where you get rewarded, rewarded, rewarded. But as for now, nothing. You're just waiting and do the best you can. And um, that's very sad um, because what that amounts to then is everything we've been talking against that it means that everything is based on your behavior. You're doing good, you're not doing bad. And then you will be rewarded for that. And again, I'm quoting from our leaders. This is all upside down. This is not what the scripture says. Um, and, and so having said that, let's, let's plunge in and, and see. This elder brother, he had an image of himself. And hear me very carefully. Um, he had an image of himself, which was that he was a slave. And in the original language, that is the word he uses. All these years I have slaved for you. And, and he had that image that he, he was the best among slaves. It was as if I'm, I'm looking for the Slave of the Year award. Um, and, I'm, and, and also... Uh, he, he used comparison, which was the big word of the Pharisees. They were forever comparing. I'm not like others. I'm better than. I don't do that. I never would do that. Comparison. And so Jesus puts that into the mouth of this elder brother as he tells the story. Uh, and the, the, the elder brother expects a reward, not only for being the best slave of the year, but because by comparison... He's outperformed his younger brother. And so I would never do that. This kid that you're celebrating in the feast, he went and he did this and he did that and he did that. I would never do that, but you don't reward me. And that was his anger. But notice very carefully, very carefully, what he wanted was an external reward. He wanted something that he could enjoy being separated from his father. He said, you know, you've given a calf to him, but you wouldn't even give me a baby goat that I might celebrate with my friends. Yeah. Meaning, you stay with the kid. I want nothing to do with that but I I thought at least you would give me a baby goat so I could get out of this place and celebrate with them. It's a very important sentence. Remembering Jesus was telling this story and every word is he puts it in for a reason. An external reward, something that was to his pleasure but separate from the Father. Um, he... he would then, if you follow it through, describe his work on the farm. He would like to do it separated from his father. Um, he, he, he's tired of being the slave, and, and he wants this reward. Um, and, of course, the reward he had demanded the public punishment of his elder brother, younger brother. It was not enough that he got rewarded for what he did, but it was when encased in gold lettering it would be said he's not like his brother and his brother in the self-same moment that the elder brother is being rewarded according to his idea of reward at that moment he had a younger brother that had to be punished the punishment of the younger brother was part of his reward do you follow that um he couldn't enjoy his heaven unless his brother was in hell because that, that's, that only shows how good I am and how stupid he is. That, that was the elder brother. Um, he had no interest whatsoever in his father's input, in his father's joy. All he wanted to use his father to get a reward that would make him happy. <coughs> Put that on there back burner the younger brother well he was looking for a reward when he came home the reward was i'm no longer worthy to be called your son make me as a hired servant and a hired servant was one who lived off property 
He didn't live on the ranch like the other servants. He was a hired servant, which would be someone that you hired when you had extra work to do. And so he said, I'll live off ranch. Just give me a chance to get a job now and again. That was his idea of reward, which of course was punishment. He recognized I've screwed up my life and therefore my reward of necessity has to be that I'm punished. And I, I'm looking for that. I'm expecting that. And that will be the right thing. But I am punished because I'm no good. I'm unworthy. I'm not even worthy to be called your son. And, and the best I can hope for is make me as one of your hired servants. That was his expectancy of reward. He, he was obsessed by this, his own sin. He was obsessed with how he had messed up his life. Uh, but then with that, he was obsessed with the condemnation that he expected from his father. Uh, he had an image of his father, a false image, and he cowered before that, terrified, and, and therefore he was condemned. Now, both of these boys, if you can call them that, are confronted by what I would call a crisis of grace, that especially the younger brother started it. He walked into the father expecting the father to agree with him 100%. And if he could twist the old man's arm to make sure he got at least some work as a hired servant, he would be satisfied. Instead, it becomes a moment of revelation, of awakening to discover his father was utterly unlike anything he'd ever dreamed. And instead, his father was love and, and grace in giving himself to the boy. And uh, he, he cuts the boy off and bring the best robe, put it on him. And of course, the elder brother sees that and so the crisis of grace that the younger brother is experiencing becomes the elder brother's nightmare. But it's the same, it's the same experience, it's a crisis of grace. I am suddenly confronted with a father that loves me. I don't even know the meaning of that. I'm, I'm confronted with a father that is not out to punish me, but rather to forgive me and really not even talk about it is not worth talking about to him, and to include him not only in the family, but as my honored guest, clothed in my best robe and put it in him. And of course, that was to the rage of religion, the, the Pharisee, the most religious of the day, that statement was enough to start the process of getting Jesus crucified. So they both announced it, both on different hours of the day. Younger brother apparently is in the morning, elder brother is in the evening, but they both have to face this crisis that has radically upset them. And that is that their father is this incarnation of love and grace and therefore he deals with the younger brother as he did and the older brother is so terribly upset with that but it's very interesting both of them both of them elder brother younger brother he ignores them he does not take up their position as something to dialogue about. And, and, and we get back to this tomorrow and talk about it more. Um, I want to hear your grievances and I want to... No. It, you remember, we've talked about it. It's, in fact, everybody does because it's right in the middle of the parable that as the younger brother is saying, you know, I'm unworthy, no good, the father cuts him off and, and is very definitive the boy does not finish his sentence doesn't even get to saying what he wanted to say the father ignored please i you you've got to hear this the boy was saying this is my reward this is my reward i deserve punishment i'm unworthy 
and, and I'm spewing out this sinner's prayer and I'm no good. <laughs> and, and, and the father steps in and he doesn't say shut up, but that's the tone. He, he just cut right in and, and said, bring the best robe and put it on him. Let's get this thing going. Uh, kill the fatted calf. We, we've got some feast to have this afternoon. And the boy stands there, but I didn't finish. <laughs> now, this, this is of supreme importance. If in Jesus we are actually dealing with God from God, God coming to tell us really what is like, this slaps us in the face as surely as it did him. He doesn't want to hear us say, I have sinned and I'm no good. And, and no, he doesn't want that. Jesus said, we don't want that. The Holy Trinity doesn't want it. Please be quiet. But we, we have such preparations that love and grace and forgiveness have prepared for you. Please be quiet. And of course, um, the, the, the elder brother had brought up some questions. He said, all these years I've slaved for you and you didn't, you didn't do this for me. Well, you would expect maybe that the father would say, well, let's sit down and talk about that. You know, I'm, I'm sorry if I have neglected you. If it, He doesn't. He cuts right in. He lets him finish, but he cuts right in and simply says, I'm always with you. All that I have is yours. Now let's get in the feast. Uh, and the elder, but just a minute, I had said, I had said, and you, you, you ignored it. This very same technique. He ignored the elder brother, ignored the younger brother by introducing to them a concept of reward and punishment come to that, that they had never thought of, never considered. Certainly, and of course, he is speaking to the Pharisees who were listening. So it's a story with, it's not only about the two boys, it's about the Pharisees. It's about us. This, even if I stopped where I, I just am right now, that would be scandalous enough. That would be dramatic enough. I've said some things there that, most churches wouldn't agree with. But in their father, in their father, they are meeting with and receiving a reward that they had never dreamed of. Okay, God bless your nod. Uh, do, do you get what I'm saying? They're coming with their very different, but their ideas of reward. And they present their ideas to the Father who ignores them, but introduces to them a concept of reward that they had never considered. Let me say it like this. They, the younger brother and the older brother, both of them, they were the Father's reward. Well, how come he could deal with them like he just did? Long suffering would be a Bible word, endless patience, a love that would never give up, and a love that believed it would never fail, and a forgiveness that had already been given when they were acting as they were. And the father's reward was when he held that younger brother in his arms and said, you are my son. I mean, cut out all that you're saying about not worthy to be called my son. You are my son. And he held him. And in the holding of his son, and able to say you are my son, that was the father's reward. And even with the older brother, his reward was finally after all these years of sitting across the table from each other and he not knowing me, finally I've got his ear and I can tell him that I'm always with you and all that I have is yours. Have you ever thought about it? We, we go rambling on about our reward. The whole New Testament is about God's reward. 
that he was rewarded um, in, in Isaiah 53, speaking of the crucifixion the, uh, and the resurrection. It speaks of the resurrection of Jesus as his reward, that he came into the, our darkness, in, into the, the depth of our sin, and he found us and he brought us out to the Father and the Father rewarded him with resurrection. But also it says in Isaiah 53, Jesus, it said, would see the travail of his soul and be satisfied. He is satisfied with what he did on the cross and resurrection. It's his reward. We are his reward. And so, but no, hold it. This It gets blessedly complicated um, because then the reward of the sons was to believe or you could say rest into and rejoice in the father's reward because his reward was their reward the father in the extent of his love and grace forgives the sons, so they, he won't even talk about it. So he forgives the sons. Well, that's his reward. But just a minute, they get for that's their reward. I, I'm giving to you the entire New Testament here in a few words. This is, they are discovering in this moment of revelation, they are discovering that their reward is his reward. It's one. They are forgiven. They are restored. They're face to face with him. They're not thrown out. That's their reward. But just a minute, I think you just saw it. That's his reward. There's a verse which um, is used greatly in these days. It's in Revelation 22, 12. And I won't say read it because you'd have to have a, a very good translation of the Bible to do it properly. It, it says, Behold, I come quickly. My reward is with me to give to every man according to his work. Boy, have I heard some nonsensical things said about that. Can I give it to you as it actually reads in the... Uh, <laughs> behold, behold, you know, I've, I've said that before. That's no big deal. Um, well, no, behold, you know, it's a word we just don't use anymore. But it, it means kind of wow. It, it's, uh, you leave me speechless, amazed. Wow, behold. But then it says... In our Bible, it's been translated, I come quickly. I'm not even going to try and explain how they came to that conclusion because what the original language says, I am constantly coming to you. Quickly doesn't mean like he'll be here at 11 o'clock. It, it means that the quickly is, is um, continuous. It's in fact the word quickly. I'm, I shouldn't even try to explain it because it doesn't fit. It means just what I said. I am constantly coming to you. Um, so it's not one day. It's not one event. It, it is in every day and every hour. He is coming to me, and as he comes to me, he says, "My reward is with me." Yes. And so. We say, well, see, he's got, like Santa Claus, he's got sackfuls of reward with him. No, he is announcing to you his reward. His reward is with him. He comes as the satisfied. He comes having seen the travail of his soul. He looks at you and he's satisfied. That's his reward. And his reward, yes, is with him. But then it says, and to give to every man, and of course, in our Bibles, it makes it sound 
according as the man's work shall be. So you better be good, you better be, you know, because Santa's come into town. Uh, is, you're going to be rewarded according to your work. No, it doesn't say that. He comes he, and he's always coming and his reward is always with him and he will re his reward is with him and it shall all be according to his work the finished work oh, yeah. the work of jesus do you you do get it i hear you um so he's coming he's always coming and he's always coming in satisfaction his reward is with him and anything we have is according to his work yeah and so our reward is awakening to his continual coming to us. Yes. Yes. We wake up. Yes. Yes. This isn't something I'm waiting to die to get, yes. nor even awaiting the second coming. Uh, this, this was how we woke up this morning. This is what is happening even now. It will be happening all day. He is continually coming to us. Earlier when speaking of Jesus, it says he is grace upon grace. Like the waves of the sea, they're continually coming grace upon grace upon grace. That's how, that's how it is. And so the favor of God is unlimitedly upon you. The delight of God. He beams at you. Um, he, and all the reward which he pours into our lives is entirely out from and because of his work and what he has done. This is where this entire chapter, because I hope as you've read chapter 15 of Luke that you've seen that there's the shepherd story, then there's the woman's coin story, then there's the story of the younger brother, and then the story of the elder brother, four stories. But they all say the same thing in a different way. And um, the, ch the whole of this chapter has been moving toward what I just said hold that in mind <clears throat> the reward that allegedly we receive is often described as a crown you read that the yeah. crown of rejoicing crown of glory crown of righteousness boy the preachers have a heyday with that one we, we've <laughs> and and one actually had pictures daftest thing it, it was a picture of something that looked like a European crown, a golden thing, you know, with would somebody please? I mean, it's no big deal. You've got every book under the sun. Uh, this is, I'm, I'm not making this up, nor did I, I pull it out of the sky. The word crown there, everybody agrees. It's, that's, it is a pathetic attempt by Westerners to say something that was all those years ago. The word there is wreath. Yes, wreath. You know that the, they they made it out of um, leaves, and they made a, a we would say a crown, a circlet really, uh, of, of leaves, and they would put that on the head of those who won the Olympic Games. It was the gold medal of the Olympic Games, or um, any kind of. Um, thing where you won something, you got this wreath. Is it too much of a step to say that the father in this story had the wreath when, when he said, you are my son. You were dead. You're alive again. You know, you were lost. You are found. It wouldn't be a stretch, even in English, to say that he was crowned with joy or whatever. It's, and then when he said to the older brother, um, I'm always with you. All that I have is yours. Here is a man speaking out of fullness, generosity, love. He just won us. He won us in the finished work of Christ. It, we are his trophy. We, we are his wreath. But then we wear the wreath 
that points away from us like any good trophy does to to the one who did it and think about it it's a crown or a wreath of righteousness well you didn't earn that so if you are wreathed if you're wearing the gold medal he got the gold medal and gave it to you and so again we have an organic relationship between his reward and our reward that we're only we were in a, a restaurant the other day in a little, little town and um you know one of those restaurants because the town is so little um the the high school Purua took over the restaurant with his pictures and and apparently he was pretty good at baseball and, and and so here you have sort of dominating the restaurant was two or three trophies and, and they were of a basketball now they they were pretty nice i mean they weren't shabby but i'll be honest i wasn't thinking about the trophies so much the trophies were telling me that they've got a pretty good basketball team um the trophy points away but then on the other hand if it's anything of the trophy itself looked pretty good and, and that's the idea that the father's trophy the father's gold medal was my sons i've got my sons what else do i want but in getting his sons the sons got him in a way they'd never dreamed before and they bear in their own person the joy of the father do you understand the the fact i'm forgiven we're so self about it i'm forgiven i'm forgiven i won't go to hell no that's not the point your being forgiven is to the honor and the joy of god he did it he did it he got gotcha. you you know do you see what i'm saying we it isn't that i'm righteous because you've got a pile of all these good things and got so many medals from sunday school and that's rubbish you know, your righteousness is that jesus himself got you so you're now face to face with the father who says you're home and you've got your own joy in this and you, you, the, the, it's all, I say organically linked. You don't have something exterior to God. Your reward is everything he is, yes. but his reward is everything you are. Yes. Yeah. And it's mentioned in Isaiah, I just throw it out, the circlet. It says, everlasting joy shall be upon their heads. That's what it's talking about. And we have come to that. But it was his everlasting joy that he now shares with us. I, I don't know if I can get this over. It's so real to me. The very first time I ever went to Africa, um, I was sent there by my denomination to bring home a woman who disobeyed. Oh, blessed woman. She went to Liberia when she was uh, 16. Now she's in her late 90s and the denomination, as all good denominations are, says your work is over and done, so now get back here because we're not going to support you anymore. You've got to come home. Well, she returned the letters. <laughs> she's not interested. She said, I'm, this is my life. This is, I'm not leaving this place. And so, in desperation, they sent me, that's my first trip to Africa, they sent me to, I guess, get this lady in chains and bring her home. And I had a ticket, her return ticket home. I knew she wasn't going to come, but what? I was getting a free trip to Africa. So, I landed in Monrovia, the capital and of course, as I would later learn, Africa is all um, ears and eyes and wows and wonders and question marks. What are you doing here? You know, you just can't turn up and be a tourist. What, what are you doing here? So I had to tell everybody I've come to get, when I mentioned her name, everybody took on a different look. They said, we're coming with you. Okay, as I would learn later, that's Africa. The tribes come with you. And, and so 
as I advanced into the jungle, she was way at the other end of Liberia. And as I advanced into the jungle, and we met other villagers, where are you going? Oh, mention her name and immediately we're coming with you. I had nearly an entourage of two, three hundred people by the time I finally got to where this woman was. And already I'd learned a lot about her. And um, she was, well, she didn't really look 94, but um, she looked old. A and she said, I know why you've come. So she said, we'll have a farewell meeting. And news travels all over the place. And I don't know how many, I'm saying two or 3,000 people gathered and in Africa, everybody must have their say. No, no one person can make a decision. Everybody must say, even if you just said what he said. But, and so I was to speak, but she said it would take about three or four days before we get to you. Uh, and um, so I sat on the platform and she apparently, when she was 16, had landed in Liberia and um, they took their girl babies and threw them on the ant piles for the ants to eat because they said that we don't, we just need one or two women. It's the men we need. And um, so she was going through the jungle and, and heard the cries of babies and she found them. And she took them off the ant piles and began orphanages. And she told them, don't ever do that again, just bring them to me. And so here comes hundreds of girls who had been saved from the ant piles. And then there came, well, I, you get the pick. I had everybody in creation standing and saying, this is what I was, this is, and this woman came, this woman came. And I, I tell you, I sat on that platform and I wept for three days, hearing what this woman had done. And it, it affected, there were officials, there were tribal chieftains. And, the, and as I sat there, I realized the joy that is here if, if I have this joy in hearing this, how much more the joy of the Holy Trinity hearing, he sees the travail of his soul and is satisfied. Um, and then in 1 Thessalonians 2, uh, Paul echoes that and he is trying to explain this reward business. And he said, look, uh, what, what is my reward? What is my wreath of rejoicing? He said, it's you guys. It's you. When I look at you, then I feel joy, which echoes back when he sees you, he has joy, and my joy is his joy. I'm organically joined to it. Do you see what I'm trying to say here? Okay. Should I try again? Yeah. The, the elder brother says, give me a goat so I can go and celebrate my friend. That is, I want nothing to do with you. You, you go and do it. But I want my... The father said to the younger brother, before I had a chance to come close to that, he says, you are my son, and today we're going to have the feast. And the, the reward that the father would give was in actual fact his reward translated to how they experienced it. Does that make sense? That it's organically joined. You can't have a reward that's just stuck in your back pocket. Um, or as our friends in other churches are saying, they're handing out rewards all over the place in heaven. Uh, no, no. God himself is our reward. And you are his reward. And therefore, we're organically connected. Do you get it? Hmm. Okay. Put it, put it this way. The sheep in the first parable doesn't get a reward for good behavior. In fact, the entire thing is about a lost sheep. 
But you do have the shepherd's reward. The shepherd's reward was having a furry <laughs> circlet, a furry wreath around his neck. That, that was the shepherd's reward. And, and when he comes home, that's all he can talk about. He's so excited. I have found my sheep which was lost. But on the other hand, the shepherd's feast, that's the meaning of the word rejoice, um, the, the shepherd's feast, which he shared with all his neighbors, the, the sheep was the honored guest because there would be no feast without the sheep. Are you with me? They rejoice with me, which means let's have a feast. Why rejoice? Because I found my sheep which was lost. Therefore, the sheep is the reason for the feast. And the sheep then is the honored guest of the feast. And the shepherd, well, he's getting his reward. I found my sheep. The sheep's reward, I've been found. And, and now I'm the honored guest. So the, the two rewards, they, they mingle, they interlock. The, the sheep participate, participated. Everything was the sheep's honor. That was the cause of the shepherd's honor. The, 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 this feast of rejoicing, in, it's in Revelation 5, which is a little kind of apocalyptic language, but it, it says there, worthy is the lamb that was slain. And your, the worthiness is set over against, you are worthy, you are worthy because that worthiness has been revealed in your being slain and redeeming us. Um, and so the fact he died and rose again to include us, that, said the feast, is his worth. So his crown, his wreath of rejoicing is that he died and rose again for you. Our wreath and crown of rejoicing is he died for me uh we're, we're, we're tied in do you understand what i'm talking about the organicness of this you know what organic means i mean it's not he over here and me over here the old separation stuff god up there god me down here no the reward is a union but it's a union so complete that it's his reward, but simultaneously is my reward. Yes. The woman, the second parable, she's rewarded for her work of turning the house inside out until she finds the coin. Then she includes her neighbor, rejoice with me. But again, why? Because I found my coin. The coin was the reason for her reward. Yeah. And the father's reward was the restoration of his sons that they could see and connect with his love his long suffering his patience it was all recompense now it was the father's reward but that very reward becomes their reward not something separate completely organically connected rejoice said the father with me again you don't get a reward you do know what i'm talking about yeah. you you've like i heard it just the other day that you know they've gone to their reward it's a cottage that they're going to live in in happiness no mention there's even god in heaven you know yeah. it's just i'm going now i'm getting my reward no, the, the rejoice with me becomes the feast that the younger brother walks into as the guest of honor. That's the father's reward, but then it's the son's reward too. He doesn't give an impersonal thing like a goat. You know, have a goat and have a barbecue. Um, the, the calf that he 
barbecued for the younger brother. That really wasn't the point. The whole point of the feast was, and it's there in, in Luke 15, that the father, together with the son, he got it. The father, to, you can see them. And the, the son isn't dragging his feet and shuffling like a homeless man. Now he's walking together with his father in his father's best robes. Um, and, and who's getting the reward here? It's the same reward, but each enjoying it from, but it's organically joined together. I mean, the, the father is rejoicing and he's honoring the son. So what he's been waiting for this for years. But the son is dizzy with delight, participating in the father's joy, and his own joy is overflowing. Which if you read John 15, Jesus makes a point there that it's not only you're getting some spiritual joy, but your joy will be full. It's overflowing. And the father... To the elder brother, he is saying it's necessary that you go into this feast. That this, you see, what you see bestowed on your brother is being constantly bestowed on you. We said this last time that he, he's looking at the elder brother and saying, you're, you're always with me. You're, you're jealous of this kid because I'm with him now for the first time in years. We're, we're together all day long. You're jealous because he's having a meal with me. We have three meals a day. Have you noticed it? You know, we notice we, we feast three times a day. We're across the table from each other. And, and in this case, that feast in there is not all about your brother. That feast in there is all about us. This is what you have as, this is our. See, if you reject grace, in one person, you are rejecting grace in your life. That's what he's saying. This has always been the case. I don't know how we missed it. Right back in Genesis 15, do you remember the king of Sodom wanted to make Abraham rich? Because um, Abraham had helped him a bit, so he's going to make him rich. And Abraham had turned him down and said, no one will ever say, the king of Sodom made me rich. But then he's going to yell. Well, what do I get? And, and he's having this debate in his head about reward, if you like, because he said, I'm supposed to have this son that's going to um, inheritance, and there's no chance of that. And then the Lord comes and says, I am your exceeding great reward. That is, I take in infinitely more than the king of Sodom could have given you and infinitely more than you're ever having a debate in your head about right now. I am your exceeding great reward. And David picked up on that and over the months we, we've talked a lot about it. But David was constantly saying, the Lord is my, or the better, I am is my He's continually discovering his union with I am. So it's not a light and a glory and a salvation and a strength that is exterior from God. Do, do you follow me? It isn't that David said he gave me strength. You follow? Yeah. That would be like me saying I gave you this book. I might never see you or the book again, but I, it's exterior to me. But when he says, God himself is my strength, that means I have no strength outside of God. It means that um, I have no salvation outside of him. It's not a thing that he gives me. I'm organically connected. I am one with him. And in that... I have all that he is. Jesus referred to that centuries later and says, Abraham saw my day and was glad. He came to a, a position of joy. Oh, put it this way. 
we say God is love. Well, then if I want love, I don't somehow do things to get more of it. Or put it this way, if you want my coat, I I could think of giving it to you. you If if you want my shoes, I could think of giving it to you. But if you want my heart, I'm sorry. (laughs) I come with my heart. I can't give my heart. I come with it. My coat, that's exterior to me, something I have, and I can give it away. My shoes are exterior to But my heart is me, my essence. And if you want my heart, you'll have to put up with me because I come with it. You follow me? So you can never get more love. You can never get more patience. Which is shocking when you hear people talk about that. Um, you can never get more long suffering, more gentleness, more goodness. I'm sorry. If you want kindness, you have to have the God who is kindness. Yes. See, He is love doesn't have it it's not external he is it so I can't cut God up in pieces and say I'll have some patience I'll have you have a relationship with God and he is love we we share in himself and there's and I want to do this but this is um the passion in the prophet Isaiah. And it's a prophecy that is now fulfilled. You know, Isaiah was writing of the days in which we live. And it says there, Isaiah 62. But I'm I'm reading from the Passion because our versions leave a bunch of words in this chapter untranslated. So it's Hebrew words all over the place that don't mean a thing. So let me read it to you. Um, Speaking of today, this is the salvation that Jesus brings. You will be called by a brand new name given to you from the mouth of Yahweh, the Lord himself. Now listen, you will be a beautiful crown held high in the hand of Yahweh. You, a royal crown of splendor, held in the open palm of your God. So you are his reward. You will never again be called the abandoned one, never again called deserted, You will be called, my delight is in you. You will be called my beloved wife, for Yahweh finds his delight in you. As a young man marries the young woman he loves, so you will be married. As the bridegroom finds joy in his union with his bride, so will your God take his joy in union with you. And then, this is um, the Old Testament that Revelation 22 referred to. Look, here comes your deliverer. See, he's bringing his reward. His recompense goes before him. You will be called his holy people, the redeemed of Yahweh. You will be known as those whom God loves. You will be known as not abandoned. He said in Exodus, you you are my unique people, which meant you're, you're my treasure set aside for me to use and delight in. Malachi says, speaking again of the resurrection, he says, in that day I will um, pick, pick up my jewels. 
So he refers to us as precious jewels. He refers to us as a unique treasure. We're his reward. It would be a jolly good idea to start delighting in yourself as God's reward. And your reward would immediately find its place. Because what I just read from Isaiah 62 is so. Is part of behold I come quickly. It's I'm coming all the time. That this this is so. And so instead of the I am unworthy mindset, I come now. This is metanoia. Remember that Greek word, which means a radical, total change of mind. It's it's what I said the other day. The sinner's prayer should be wow. It's, I've had a mind change. I've, if you really understand that you are his reward, that's the biggest wow you will ever say. We have been brainwashed by religion to continually grovel in unworthiness and say, that is my name and that's who I am. He interrupts and declares you to be his reward and, and rejoice with me. I, I have found my sheep and you're my honored guest. And what I'm saying is not just today, I am saying learn to begin your day. Learn to put your legs out of bed as the reward of the Most High God. That's who you are goes against all logic uh, of our human flesh and he goes against all logic of religion if religion has any logic at all <laughs> and because there's people on the other side that's where some people live but on the other side there's always the elder brother who they are trying so desperately to find that one thing that they can do that will impress God enough to like them. Um, the, the younger brother never thought about that. but um, And most of us don't. Most of us wallow in guilt and shame and condemnation. But there are others who are so full of pride and religion that they are always looking, what can I do? What could I do? to get the acceptance of, of God. And of course, this absolutely blows that person apart to know that you can't do anything. He's done everything and you are right now his reward. Or as the father said to the elder brother, who is saying essentially, what do you want from me so that I can be accepted? And the father's only response was, I'm always with you. Meaning nothing. There is nothing you can do except to realize that I, who am your greatest reward, am always with you. And all that I have is yours. And, and I'm thinking of people right now, and I'm sure you are too, they have actually asked that question. What, what, what must I do? You know, how could I do something to be a better Christian? And it's always my delight to say nothing, nothing. I love to say that and see the horror on their face. Nothing. You've got to wake up and realize he did everything and it is his love that embraced you, pulls you to himself and declares you are his reward. And when you realize that, then you have all the rewards you've ever looked for. The, and and it, it's, it's present tense because with both of these kinds of people, they want to push this off till tomorrow. Again, religion has taught us that. Uh, re <clears throat> that's why they always say it's the second coming, yeah. <clears throat> it's got this off my back for today. <laughs> you follow me? If you get all this when you die, well, that's not today. So, you know, just... Hang loose for today, do the best you can, try and look happy. But anything you're looking for is when you die. 
That's when I'm going to get my reward. Hell yeah, I heard that. That's when I'm going to get my reward. Yeah, no, no. If you don't have your reward today, you have missed the whole point of the gospel. It's, it's, not, it's always in the present tense. And it's very interesting if you go through the, these parables with a fine tooth comb. Jesus says, I am always with you, to the elder brother, I am. He didn't say, if you'll stop thinking like an idiot, I'll be with you. Yeah. <laughs> he says, I am. And I have been with you through all of your convoluted days of trying to find the one thing to please me. I've been with you. Uh, and to, to the, the younger son, you are my son. He could easily have picked up on when the son says, I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. He would have said, boy, you're right there. But now if you, you know, I've got this program here of 12 steps that if you, you'll be a good son at the end of it. No, he says, you are my son. And that are encompassed the whole thing the boy had just been talking about. So that meant while you were in the bars and the brothels of the far country, while you were with the pigs, while you were as low as you could get, you're my son. My son that smells like a pig, but you're still my son. And you are now my son, and you will be my son. You can't unson yourself. You are. It's always prayer. Behold, I am coming always to you. It's, it's a present tense. Um... And so being lost and being dead is behind him. He says, you're now alive. You're found. It's constant reality. The, the word agape, God's love, if you define it, is a continual movement of God toward us. He never quits. It's always, the, the love of God is always coming toward us. Always to know and be known. Um, but now the, the interesting thing, I'm not going to spend time, I think, because this will be quick. Um, it's reward and punishment. Do you realize the very same thing that I've just been spending an hour on is also punishment? God comes to the elder brother. Huh. I've already tried to say that's not really what we'd expect him to say. He comes to elder brother as elder brother is, standing on the porch in the darkness, unwilling to go in, and the father comes alongside of him, an act of gentleness, kindness, and love, and says, I am always with you. And all I wanted was a goat to go and celebrate with my friends. And you're there saying, I'm always with you. Couldn't you give me a break? Couldn't you go and do something on the other side of the farm so I can get out of here and enjoy myself? No, I'm always with you. Couldn't I earn something so I feel proud about it? No, all that I have is yours. Uh -huh. Do you realize the torments of love that will never quit. You don't want his love. You don't want his grace. But his love will never quit and his grace won't leave you alone. Amen. They call that the flames of hell. I, I, I'm stuck with this. I'm stuck with a love that will not let me go. I'm stuck with a grace that won't stop forgiving me. I can't do anything to stop God loving me. And to many people, that's torment. You know, um, I, I, I guess I've said enough about these others, but we've talked about it before, you know. They will come and especially in public places, airports and the like. And it is honestly, I, I, I have compassion for them when they come. They're usually the younger kind, got bright little eyes, 
They come and say, do you know where you'll spend eternity? Which is enough to make me run for my life anyway, but they call it witnessing. And um, inevitably the question comes up sooner or later, uh, do you want to go to heaven when you die? You realize that's a wicked question. Not only stupid, but wicked. Because that's nowhere in the New Testament. No one ever asked that question in the New Testament. The question should be, if you're going to go on that route, do you want to come home to the Father? Do you want to go and be with him forever? Do you want to die into the arms of your Father? You would find a very different reaction. You see, when you say, do you want to go to heaven when you die, people bring all these pagan ideas about heaven. I remember when I was in New York, and um, the, the people in New York, you know, they go on the streets and ask people, do you want to go to heaven when you die? And I had this drug addict, and I say, tell me honestly, what, what, what do you think heaven is? You know, these people said, do you want to go to heaven? What, what do you think heaven is? And he was so serious, he looked at me, a heaven? He said, would be the Himalaya mountains of cocaine. Wow. He said, then I would never have to be anxious again of buying cocaine. He was honest. And here people said, do you want to go to heaven? He said, oh, cocaine forever. Heaven... I don't know what you mean, so we just cut it out. Jesus says, no one comes to the Father but by me. You are the Father's reward. And if you are thinking in terms of heaven, you're thinking in terms of being embraced with a love that will not let you go forever and ever. You are thinking about infinite joy, infinite peace, infinite kindness and gentleness all making life and that is that's the question that changes our behavior to know that i am the father's reward to know that the son looks at me and you and says i'm satisfied and the Holy Spirit to be working within that, and that's his message to us. To know that means your behavior will totally change. If I come with law and say, you mustn't do this, you mustn't do that, sure you'll do it. The Bible says that. It's the curse of the law. But if I come not to tell you how bad you are, but to tell you that it doesn't matter how bad you are, you are the Father's reward of love, that he'll never let you go. That will change your behavior. One way or the other. You see, why, why do we do half the things we do that we would call of sin or wrong? It's because... <clears throat> We don't know Father's love. What, why was the younger brother eating with the pigs? Because he didn't know he was loved. Yeah. And he felt this is, this is what I, this was natural for me because I, I'm condemned, I'm no good anyway, so why not? It's what you know of God's love determines your behavior. And if you rise up in rage at that love, it produces behavior that you would never thought you would do, which is what the elder brother did. He was goody two-shoes, never thought he would do what he did. But it was seeing his father's love that made him act so crazy. God's love is the determining point. So... The younger brother went into the feast. 
and there sat down and out of the corner of his eye he saw his father beaming at him a smile from ear to ear and that was the father's reward being expressed but in that same moment it was the son's reward in knowing I'm home and that's it that's where we live and that's what reward and punishment is all about and I don't think there's a number five I think this this is it this is this is it so father we give you thanks because every word we've said is truth and real and now from this room where we sit to all those on zoom and all those that shall hear this on tuesday night holy spirit open our eyes open our eyes to see ourselves as you see us and become to us the very faith of god to lay hold upon which is ours give you thanks in the name lord jesus christ amen and amen